Uh, it's always a blessing to be able to uh, come into the Lord's presence, to come to the sanctuary on this weekly divine appointment that He has established, uh, the Shabbat. And we welcome you uh, to Adon Alam Messianic Congregation. We want to mention that we are in the 40-day uh, season that is known as Teshuvah. Uh, it's a traditional observance uh, by our Jewish people, a time of introspection uh, that begins on the first day of the sixth month, which is the Hebrew month called Elul. See, I knew, I knew y'all are out there. Okay, very good. And it's actually the 40 days from the beginning of that month until Yom Kippur, or actually the scriptures technically call the day Yom Kippurim, or Yom HaKippurim, the Day of Atonement. Uh, the day when uh, the people came before the Lord seeking uh, atonement in the way that He had uh, prescribed for them. Uh, we use the term Teshuvah. It's frequently translated as repent. Uh, it also contains the Hebrew root uh, Shuv, which is normally translated as return. So in Teshuvah, we see that we are really turning back uh, to the Lord. And it is only through Messiah Yeshua that we are able to leave our ways and turn back to the Lord and His ways. And we actually have a, um, a pamphlet on the materials table that uh, you are welcome to take uh, that tells you a little bit more about the season of Teshuvah. Each day during this period, uh, often by tradition, the shofar is sounded uh, as a call to uh, look within. And so I'm going to now call up Mick Jones uh, to sound a blast on the shofar as a call to assembly and a call to ask the Lord to search our hearts as we listen to the sound of the shofar. And now I'm going to call up Mae Galloway uh, to usher in the Sabbath in the traditional way, and that's with the lighting of the Sabbath candles. Uh, since the scriptures, uh, one of the things that are forbidden on the Sabbath, according to the scriptures, is the lighting, the kindling of a fire. Uh, the last thing we are able to do before the Sabbath officially begins uh, is to light the Sabbath candles. We have two because there are two instructions regarding the Sabbath, and often two are used by tradition. We're to remember the Sabbath and to keep the Sabbath holy. sanctified us by your word and given us Yeshua our Messiah and commanded us to be a light to the world. Amen. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you, May. And now I'm going to call up our cantor for the evening, Eli Scott, and ask you to please stand as we will be chanting the prayer known as the Shema. This prayer uh, is based on Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4. And in this prayer, as a community, we affirm the oneness, the uniqueness of our God. Yeshua referred to the first line of the Shema as the greatest commandment. We'll chant the prayer in Hebrew and then recite the English translation, followed by the chanting of the Via Hafta, the verses that come afterwards in Deuteronomy 6, and we will translate that as well. Together, the Shema. Shema Yisrael Hear, 
O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be His glorious name, whose kingdom is forever and ever. And now the Via Hafta. Hadavarim ha ele Asher anachi Mitzabcha Hayom Alevavecha Veshinatam Levanecha Vidibarta Baam Veshivtecha Bevetecha Uvlechtecha Vaderech Uvshachbecha Ukumecha Ukshatam Leot and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day shall be upon your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. And you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand, and they shall be frontlets between your eyes. And you shall write them upon the doorposts of your house, and on your gates, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. Please join me as we open our service in prayer. Eloheinu, Elohavo Tenu, Elohavraham, Elohe Yitzchak, Elohe Yaakov. Our God and God of our fathers, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and God of Jacob. Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity to gather together on this weekly divine appointment that you have established. Uh, Lord, as we ask you to bless this service, we ask you to use it for your purposes. Lord, we ask you to bless each one who is here. Uh, Lord, that their eyes would be open to see and their ears would be open to hear and their hearts would be open to receive from you tonight, Lord, uh, as we desire to see a move of your Ruach, a supernatural move of your Spirit, Lord, in our midst this evening. And Lord, we just uh, ask you to, uh, we just come before you, Lord, thankful for all of the blessings of this past week. And Lord, no matter what has taken place, we always have the ultimate blessing uh, that you provided your son as the sacrifice for our sins, that we might be able to uh, receive the gift that you offer to us, the gift of salvation. And Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for all that you're going to do in this service as we ask you to anoint the singing, the dancing, the worship, the praise, the message, the liturgy, the fellowship, everything that we do this evening, Lord. We just desire that it would bring glory, honor, and praise to you. And we ask these things in our Messiah Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated, and now I'm going to call up Janiel Scott uh, to make a few announcements for us this week. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. And welcome to Adon Olam Messianic Congregation. If you're a first-time visitor this evening, please raise your hand so that we might recognize you. No visitors tonight. Um, we have new calendars available in the gift shop at a price of $10. These calendars start in September of 2022 and go through the end of 2023. Next Friday, September 16th at 7.30 p.m., Jewish believer Michael Cohen will be here sharing on the end times. Messianic recording artist Deb Klein and her husband, Vince Ian Torno, will also be here leading us in praise and worship. Make plans to be with us for this special evening. And on Sunday, September 25th at 7.30 p.m., we will have our evening Rosh Hashanah Feast of Trumpets service. The following day, Monday, September 26th at 4 p.m., we will have our Feast of Trumpets day service. Mark these dates on your calendar so you can join us as we begin our High Holy Day observances. We pray the Lord's blessings upon you and hope that you will feel His sweet spirit as you worship with us. Once again, Shabbat Shalom. 
Thank you, Janiel. Uh, <clears throat> all right, now we're going to chant the traditional prayer known as the Vishamru. Uh, it means, and they shall keep, and we will be chanting the Hebrew of Shemot, Exodus 31, verses 16 and 17. We'll chant the prayer in Hebrew, and then we will have an English translation, and we have added a Messianic paragraph uh, at the end of the English translation, the Vishamru. Vishamru vene Yisrael et ha-shabat Together the translation. The children of Israel shall keep the Shabbat to observe it throughout their generations as an everlasting covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he ceased from work and rested. And we know our Messiah Yeshua observed the Shabbat. In the New Covenant Scriptures we are told, as was his custom, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. Amen. Now we are going to enter into the scripture portion of our service, and I'll call forward our ARC opener, Randall Anderson, as well as Fred Scott, who will be leading us in this portion of the service. And we would ask you to please stand as the ARC is opened. The ARC is the traditional name for the furniture that houses the scroll containing the first five books of the Bible uh, in the uh, Hebrew, uh, and it's referred to as the five books of Moses. That scroll is uh, prepared by specially trained craftsmen known as scribes, uh, and it is, enables us to have an accurate uh, copy of the revelation of the creator of the universe. And it came to pass, whenever the ark went forward, Moses would say, Arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered. May those who hate you flee from before you. For from Zion shall go forth the Torah, and the word of the Lord out of Jerusalem. Blessed be he who in holiness gave the Torah to his people Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Unique is our God, great is our Lord, holy and revered is his name. Magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and the earth is yours. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom 
and you are exalted as head over all. Exalt the Lord our God, and worship at his holy mount. For the Lord our God is holy. Amen. I want to ask our scripture readers to come forward. He who blessed our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, may he bless Philip, son of Yeshua, and Pamela, daughter of Yeshua, who have come up to honor God and his word. And now for the blessing before the reading of the Torah. Baruch Adonai Hamvarach. Bless the Lord who is blessed. Baruch Adonai Hamvarach Leolam Bless the Lord who is blessed forever and ever. Baruch Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam Asher Bacharon Mikol Ha'anim Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who chose us from all peoples and gave us the Torah. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the Torah. Amen. This is the 14th day of the sixth month on the Hebrew calendar, the month of Elul. Our, our Torah reading for this evening is taken from Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 17 through 19. In Hebrew, the name of the book is Davarim. We'll be reading from chapter 25, verses 17 through 19, found on page 225 in the Complete Jewish Bible. Remember what Amalek did to you on the way as you came out of Egypt, how he attacked you on the way when you were faint and weary, and cut off your tail, those who were lagging behind you, and he did not fear God. Therefore, when the Lord your God has given you rest from all your enemies around you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance to possess, you shall blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. You shall not forget. Amen. Amen. The blessing following the reading of the Torah. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech ha-Torah Asher natanayu tirad emet Bechai olam nata betocheinu Baruch atah Adonai Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who gave us the Torah of truth and life everlasting planted in our midst. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of our Torah. Amen. And now for the congregational response following the reading of the Torah. Blessing before the reading of the Haftarah. 
Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who chose good prophets, delighting in their words, which were spoken truthfully. Blessed are you, O Lord, who chose the Torah, your servant Moses, your people Israel, and the prophets of truth and righteousness. Amen. Amen. Our Haftarah portion for this evening is from Isaiah chapter 54, verses 7 through 10. In Hebrew, the name of the book is Yeshihahu Hanavi. We'll be reading from chapter 54, verses 7 through 10, found on page 523 in the Complete Jewish Bible. For a brief moment I deserted you, but with great compassion I will gather you. In overflowing anger, for a moment I hid my face from you, but with everlasting love I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. This is like the days of Noah to me, as I swore that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth. So I have sworn that I will not be angry with you, and I will not rebuke you. For the mountains may depart, and the hills may be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you, and my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. Amen. 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 The blessing following the reading of the Haftarah. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, Rock of all ages, righteous throughout all generations. You are the faithful God, promising and then performing, first speaking, then fulfilling, for all your words are true and righteous. Faithful are you, O Lord our God, and faithful are your words, for no word of yours shall remain unfulfilled. You are a faithful and merciful God and King. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, who are faithful in fulfilling your words. Amen. Amen. And now for the blessing before the reading of the New Covenant Scriptures. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, Asher matam banu Mashiach Yeshua, Vehayib roshel habrit v'chadasha, Baruch atah Adonai, Notein habrit v'chadasha, Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us Messiah Yeshua and the words of the renewed covenant. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the new covenant. Amen. Our Ben HaKadoshah portion for tonight is from Galatians chapter 3, verses 10 through 14. Again, we'll be reading from Galatians chapter 3, verses 10 through 14, found on page 1454 in the Complete Jewish Bible. For everyone who depends on legalistic observance of the Torah commands lives under a curse, since it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not keep on doing written everything written in the scroll of the Torah. Now it is evident that no one comes to be declared righteous by God through legalism since the person who is righteous will attain life by trusting and being faithful. Furthermore, legalist, legalism is not based on trusting and being faithful, but on a misuse of the text that says, anyone who does these things will attain life through them. The Messiah redeemed us from the curse pronounced in the Torah by becoming cursed on our behalf. The Torah for the Tanakh says, everyone who hangs from a stake comes under a curse. Yeshua the Messiah did this so that in union with him the Gentiles might receive the blessing announced to Abraham so that through trusting and being faithful we might receive that was promised, namely the Spirit. And now the blessing following the reading of the New Covenant Scriptures. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, 
אשר נתן לנו הדבר האמת, וחי העולם נתן בתוכנו, ברוך אתה אדוני, נותן הברית החדשה. אמן. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us the word of truth and life everlasting planted in our midst. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the renewed covenant. Amen. When the ark rested, Moses would say, Return, O Lord, to the myriads of Israel's families. Arise, O Lord, to your resting place, you and your mighty ark. Clothe your priests with righteousness. May those who experience your faithful love shout for joy. Hallelujah! For the sake of your servant David, do not delay the return of your Messiah. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, ruler of the universe, who gives us the living word and the Messiah Yeshua. Amen. Amen. When the ark is closed, you may be seated. Please join me in reciting, He being merciful. He being merciful forgives iniquity and does not destroy. Frequently he turns away his anger and does not stir up all his wrath. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving and exceedingly kind to all who call upon you. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The blood of Yeshua, our Messiah, cleanses us from all sin. Amen. One day all the world will see, but right now it takes a little bit more to convince them. Uh, and uh, I just wonder how much craziness they have to see in the world before they realize that uh, the world does not have uh, the answers uh, and can't even uh, figure out how to save itself. And that's why uh, the Lord in His omniscience realized He would have to provide the way of salvation. And it is really a blessing because that is exactly what he did uh, in the form of Yeshua, which even means salvation. <clears throat> I wanted to remind you that uh, next Friday, Michael Cohen, a Jewish believer, uh, will be here sharing on, uh, a message that uh, explores a little bit about the end time. So uh, if that's of interest to you, I would definitely encourage you to be here for that. Uh, and also, as an uh, extra blessing, uh, we will have our good friends uh, Deb Klein and Vince Ian Torno uh, leading us in the praise and worship next week. So that is something uh, definitely to look forward to. A little change of pace as we get ready for the high holidays. Uh, to bring you uh, up to date a little bit in last week's Torah portion, uh, beginning in Deuteron De yeah, Deuteron Deuteronomy, Devarim, chapter 18, verse 15, uh, we find Moses saying that the Lord will raise up a prophet like him, uh, who will provide guidance to God's people, who will stand in the gap between them and him. And we said that this promise was fulfilled in part through the uh, selection of Moses' successor, Yehoshua, Joshua. Uh, to lead the people into the promised land. And it was also fulfilled in part, if you'll remember, by the line of prophets that spoke to Israel, saying to them, Thus saith the Lord. But the ultimate fulfillment of this prophecy is found in Messiah Yeshua. Because just as Moses redeemed the people, redeemed our Jewish people out of their bondage in Egypt, so too Messiah Yeshua came to lead our Jewish people and all who would believe on him out of their bondage to sin. And last week's Torah portion ended with a mystery. A dead body had been found, you may remember, but it could not be determined who had committed the murder. The Torah said that a cow should be sacrificed to provo provide atonement for this sin against the land. And then the leaders of the nearest town were to proclaim that they did not know who had committed this sin. They were to ask the Lord to forgive his people, Israel, to not allow innocent blood to be shed among his people. And they are, they are told that this process will result 
in their being forgiven for this shedding of blood. Let us just go to the Lord in prayer. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Lord, we thank you that you have provided not only Messiah Yeshua uh, as the sacrifice that brings our salvation, forgiveness for our sins, and even a restored relationship with the creator of the universe, but you have also provided uh, your Torah, your instructions uh, as to how you would have us to live. And we thank you uh, for this written revelation uh, that we have received, that has been passed down and preserved. And Lord, I pray that uh, we would find truths revealed that would help us for the challenges that we face in the days ahead, that would help us to draw closer to you, that would help us to be more conformed to the image of your Son. I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be acceptable in your sight, my rock and my redeemer. I ask it in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. This week's Torah portion is called Ki Tetze, uh, meaning when you go out. As uh, the portion begins in Devarim, Deuteronomy 21, verse 10, uh, and it refers to when the Israelites go out to war, how they are to treat any women that are captured when they are victorious over their enemies. While in the rest of the world, these women were often mistreated, the Israelites were to do it differently. They were to treat them with respect. Their treatment of these women were, was to reflect the goodness of their God. And the rest of the portion contains a number of stipulations, instructions that are, we find in a suzerainty treaty. Uh, as we've pointed out, uh, as we've been going through the book of Devarim, Deuteronomy, that seems to be a, the format actually of the book. Uh, we find this treaty format of that time reflected in the layout of the book. And the, this type of treaty would be executed between a conquering king and the subjects that he had conquered. Uh, now, I have a question for you. Does anybody know, according to the rabbis, how many commandments we find in the Torah? Okay. Everybody knows, apparently. And that's good. 248 of those 613 commandments are positive, and 365 are negative. There are 248 shalls and 365 shall nots. And there are uh, 74 of the 613 instructions or commandments are found in this week's Torah portion, more than in any other Torah portion. And we're going to cover every one of them tonight. So I hope you plan on staying for a while. No. But here's one that, that you might be able to relate to even today. One of the key instructions found in uh, the Torah, uh, in the book of Deuteronomy, is uh, the uh, instruction about how to love. Uh, it's, the word love is mentioned over 20 times in the book of Deuteronomy alone. Both the love of the Lord for his people and the instruction to love the Lord. Deuteronomy 7, verses 7 and 8. And I'm going to read it from the King James translation since it's talking about uh, the Lord's love for the Jewish people. The Lord did not set his love upon you nor choose you because ye were more in number than any people. For you, ye were the fewest of all. But because the Lord loved you and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn to your fathers. And then Deuteronomy 6.5 tells us, as we say every Friday night uh, in the Via Hafta, as we uh, both chanted and uh, translated earlier, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Now this type of love is not a feeling like the world would have us believe. Uh, because the world says you can fall in love, or, and, but it, that would imply you can also fall out of love. And uh, that is not the type of love that we find in the scriptures. The type of love is unconditional. You can fall in to that understanding, but you can't fall out. Because there's nothing that the other person can do that would cause you to stop loving them. Why is that? Because that's how the Lord loves us. 
And that is a, a security that is such a tremendous blessing uh, to us that we should not take for granted. Um, <clears throat> it, it's, it, it's not just a feeling, as the world would tell us, but we actually show how we uh, demonstrate that type of love is through our actions. Hebrew is a language of action. Uh, in the uh, English, we would say, in the translation, it'll say, and the Lord spoke to Moses. But in the Hebrew, it literally says, and spoke the Lord to Moses. The verb comes first. It's a language of action. The Jewish people, they're not concerned with what we say to them. They're watching us. The world does the same. It's looking to see if our actions back up what we are saying. And that's because we are to be a people of action. Our actions should reflect what has been revealed to us in the Scriptures. John 3.16 is a perfect example of this. You all know it. For God so loved the world that He just really thought nicely about it and just kind of uh, eyes with hearts on them going back and forth. No. That He gave His only begotten Son. I mean, you talk about action. Uh, that is the ultimate act of love, the ultimate demonstration of the love of our Creator for His creation, so that everyone who trusts in Him may have eternal life instead of experiencing the utter destruction that we deserve because of our rebellion against Him. In Deuteronomy 10 verse 19, we find something very interesting. The Israelites were told to love the sojourner. I know some translations don't say that, but it's the Hebrew word ger. Those who, while they were not Jewish, they are to be loved just the same as they were to love their fellow Israelites. And that continues the theme that we have seen over and over as to how the sojourners in their midst were to be treated as full members of the community. Uh, and if we're honest about it, all of us need God's love. And we need His revelation of His eternal truths now more than ever. Um, as we're reminded every day of how crazy this world is. I mean, you know, we have the normal struggles of life in this world. Uh, you know, people grow old and, and pass away. I mean, we've been reminded of that in, in a big way with the passing of the Queen of England um, yesterday at the age of 96 and yet everybody's talking about you know what a shock it was and, and it's because we even have terms that we use to kind of deny the reality of what we are all going to face unless the Lord returns the world's ultimate weapon actually is death but the reality is the scriptures reveal that we have experienced victory over death by accepting the sacrifice of Messiah Yeshua, we are no longer bound by that limitation in this world. We have experienced eternal life. We will spend the rest of eternity in the presence of a holy and righteous Creator. And obviously, we could do nothing to deserve that. <clears throat> that just is a demonstration of God's grace uh, toward us in terms of His plan of redemption. And we're tasked with going out into the world and bringing this message to them in a loving way, in a way that they will be open to receive. We're not to force it down their throat. We're not to beat them over the head with it. Uh, you know, we're not to um, convince them that they must believe this. We're, we're to share the blessing that we have experienced that they might desire that same blessing. Uh, so we have our, our normal day-to-day -day struggles. We also have been dealing with the effects of a pandemic uh, for the last couple of years. And we also have uh, a deep division even in our nation. And actually, we see the same type of division uh, in Israel and throughout the world, uh, what we call the culture wars, uh, as this world thumbs its nose more and more at biblical truth. For example, all the way back in Genesis, in Genesis 1, verse 27, it says a male and a female is how he created them. 
Uh, that's the Young's literal translation. For thousands of years, no one took issue with this concept. Yet part of the culture war is a d disagreement over this reality today. Yet we are called to a more excellent way. We are called to be able um, to show love in the midst of any circumstances. We can see these uh, challenges that we face as opportunity, it, it, just our daily struggles, our opportunities to maintain or even grow our faith. Uh, as the, we can see these times of struggle as blessings in our life, as producing something positive uh, rather than what our flesh would tell us, which is, this is horrible, it can't accomplish anything good, I'm just waiting for it to be over. Uh, and then we can also overcome what we see in our nation, in the world today, and that is um, people being uh, hateful towards others just based on their preconceptions of what they believe, something that we thought we were had fought the battle against uh, last century, and we thought we had the victory and that we would not prejudge people, but we find that, that we're fighting those same types of battles all over again, just in different ways. Uh, <clears throat> it's actually believers that are the primary group that you can get away with prejudging today and saying negative things about without a uh, harsh backlash. And that's a, an example of how good the enemy is uh, at deceiving the world. And we have to make sure that as followers of Messiah, we spend time in His Word. We spend time in fellowship with Him so that we will not be deceived. We will be able to be light in a world of darkness. I often say, you know, uh, it's easy to look at the craziness of this world and get frustrated and discouraged. But if we are able to see it as the darker things get in this world, the brighter our light can shine. That's just an example of how we can be light in the darkness to a world that is just in, dark, in darkness, uh, lost, and, and groping, and not able to even know where it is going uh, and what obstacles lie in its way. When the world tells us to hate, we can demonstrate unconditional love. Uh, it, it's easy to love those who deserve to be loved, uh, or certainly when they deserve to be loved. But we're called to love when they don't deserve it because that is exactly what we have experienced. And the way we really come to the best understanding of what we have experienced it is when we're able to demonstrate it towards others. We can, as it says in Romans 12 verse 21, we can conquer or overcome evil with good. So when we see evil out in the world, that's just a challenge to us to display the goodness of God that we have experienced, to display the goodness of God through our comforting and ministering and encouraging words. The next stipulation, Deuteronomy 21, verses 16 and 17, talks about uh, the inheritance rights of a firstborn son to receive a double portion of their inheritance. This is important because in Shemot, Exodus 4, verse 22, Israel is referred to as the Lord's firstborn. And as we have seen recently, double portions are not always applied in the positive, not only applying to inheritance, but in Isaiah 40, verse 2, Israel also received a double portion of punishment for all of her sins. Then we come to a stipulation concerning a rebellious son, uh, found in Deuteronomy 21, verses 18 and 19. And the parents, uh, according to this stipulation, are to take their son to the gates of the town and tell the leaders that their son is stubborn and rebellious, he doesn't pay attention to them, and he is living wildly. And according to Deuteronomy 21, verses 20 and 21, all of the men of his town are to administer discipline to him by doing what? Stoning him to death. Um, death, it seems a, a little harsh, but the verse says 
that this will put an end to this type of wickedness as all Israel will hear about it and be afraid. Now, first of all, this is a violation of the instruction in Exodus 20, verse 12, where we're told to honor our father and mother, right? In the uh, Big Ten, as we say, the Ten Commandments, the Ten Words. Uh, also, failure to submit to earthly authorities could lead to failure to submit to our heavenly authority, our heavenly Father, uh, which is a really bad idea. Matthew 10, verse 28 says, Do not fear those who kill the body, but are powerless to kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in Gehinom. And Gehinom uh, was the place where outside Jerusalem they burned the trash that had been generated with an everlasting fire. And it symbolically represents uh, the life in the world to come for those who have rejected God and rejected His provision of Messiah Yeshua, uh, of uh, being able to find forgiveness for their rebellion against the Lord and His ways. We should also note that it's the leaders of the town who are to stone the child. Because the rebellion is not just against the parents, but it's also a sin against the entire community. Today, many believers fail to appreciate. They, they don't really understand the communal nature of God's relationship with His people. We've explained in the past uh, that when there is sin in the community, we've seen examples in the Scripture. It doesn't just affect one person or the person who was wronged. It doesn't just affect their family, but sin affects the entire community. Hebrews 10 verses 24 and 25 tells us to spur each other on to love and good deeds, not neglecting our own congregational meetings, the times that we come together as a community, as some do, but instead encouraging each other. And even more, as times grow more difficult nearing the day of the return of Messiah Yeshua. It is revealed to us that things are not going to be um, magically transformed in this world and start getting better and better and better. Actually, as we near the time of the returning of Messiah, it is clear that He is going to return because things get worse and worse. In Zechariah 14, we find out that His return is to deliver Israel when all the nations are lined up against her, ready to destroy her, and they would succeed if not for the return of Messiah Yeshua. And He told them He wouldn't come back until they say, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai, blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord. And it's not hard to see a picture of them crying out in desperation when their destruction seems imminent and they realize that Messiah Yeshua is their only chance at being able to escape uh, the uh, desires of this world to destroy them. Uh, we, we're reminded of it on a regular basis. They, they say that anti-Semitism uh, is growing more and more in this world. Um, we uh, fortunately haven't perhaps experienced that a lot in this area, but in other parts of the world, uh, the unexplained, other than from a spiritual standpoint, the, the unexplained hatred against the Jewish people, uh, even though they have blessed the world in many ways, uh, nonetheless, uh, the world finds the smallest little uh, failure because Israel, like the rest of us, uh, are human and we are not perfect. Uh, and the world seizes on that uh, as an opportunity to hold them to a standard higher than any other nation uh, and criticize them when the nation seeks to be a blessing, not only to its friends in the world, but even to its enemies. 
Whenever there's a disaster in the world, even in Muslim lands, Israel is one of the first nations to say, you know, we have expertise in, in this area. Can we uh, come in and help you? Talking about uh, primarily uh, earthquakes, but even other types of disasters, mine accidents, uh, various situations. Israel is always uh, ready to help. And they also minister to their enemies by providing uh, their sustenance. The Gaza Strip needs food and water from Israel every day, otherwise the people wouldn't be able to survive. And Israel continues um, to provide that, even sometimes in the midst of wars when they're being attacked uh, from that very region. We are to encourage one another, and that becomes even more important as times grow more challenging. Uh, you know, I, I'm, we don't have as many people here as we sometimes do. I know one of the reasons is because it's hard to compete with Friday night football, high school football, but the reality is, for our younger people, but the reality is um, that it's important that we come together. It's important that we encourage one another. Not because I said it, but because the scriptures make that clear. Uh, in uh, the words revealed to us by the author of Hebrews, who, would, by the uh, revelation of the Spirit, wrote words that I believe are intended for the times that we are living in and even to the future. And this reflects the emphasis on community that we find in Vayikra, Leviticus chapter 23, where most of the Moadim, uh, most of the appointed times, including the upcoming Feast of Trumpets, Yom Teruah, Rosh Hashanah, three different names, uh, and the Day of Atonement, are to be observed as a community. There's to be a Mikra Kodesh, a sacred assembly, a holy time of gathering together as a community. Uh, according to Levit Leviticus 23, verse 3, this is also true of the weekly Sabbath as we are doing here tonight. And we're also told in Deuteronomy 21, verses 22 and 23, that a person who is executed for a crime by being hung on a tree is considered to have been cursed by God. Rabbi Shaul, the Apostle Paul, as we read earlier, applies this passage to what happened to Messiah Yeshua, uh, as we saw in, Galatians, in our reading from Galatians chapter 3. Paul is going to make all of the arguments in this passage not based on something new, not based on some new revelation that came with Messiah Yeshua coming to this world, but based on the Hebrew Scriptures. He starts out in Galatians 3.10, and he says based on Deuteronomy 27, verse 26. It's actually why the letter D is found at the end of the passage as we just uh, lift it using the software out of the complete Jewish Bible. Reference D was Deuteronomy 27, verse 26, uh, that all who try to achieve righteousness through the works of the Torah find themselves cursed because they sometimes fail to put the words of the Torah into practice. Uh, it's, it's easy to read it. It's a whole different level to be able to put it into practice. Uh, and, and notice the word is practice. We're not going to be perfect every time, but we are to keep practicing because as the expression goes, practice makes perfect. We, we improve as we practice. In Galatians 3 verse 11, Shaul quotes another verse from the Hebrew Scriptures. This is Habakkuk, uh, Habakkuk 2 verse 4. Uh, it's reference E. It says that the righteous shall live by faith. Paul wants the Galatians to understand something that he realizes when in his old Pharisee days he did not understand. That the Hebrew Scriptures reveal that righteousness comes by trusting in the Lord, not by the keeping of Torah. And in Galatians 3 verse 13, Paul writes, Messiah has redeemed us from the curse of the Torah, uh, one, that's reference G, referring to uh, the passage in Deuteronomy 21 that we just read, by being cursed on our behalf. Notice that Paul is not saying, as some might suggest, that this means the Torah has been done away with. 
What's been done away with is the curses of the Torah that we should have received because of our inability to keep it the way it is supposed to be kept, the way it has to be kept perfectly. Uh, there is a curse for failure to, be, to keep it in this way if we're trying to achieve righteousness, but that failure, that cursing was taken on by Messiah Yeshua. And he was the only one who, ironically, who ever was able to keep Torah perfectly, as we talked about last week. He had to be without sin to be a suitable sacrifice. And so, uh, even though he w w uh, kept Torah perfectly, nonetheless, uh, he was accused of a crime, and his punishment was being hung on a tree, an execution stake made of wood such that he became cursed on our behalf. And Paul goes on to say in Galatians 3 verse 14 that the blessing that was announced to Abraham receiving the Spirit comes through trusting in the Lord. Once again, not Torah keeping and is therefore not limited to the Jewish people but is available as revealed in Acts 10 verses 45 and 46 to those from the nations as well. Stern uses the term goyim, which is the Hebrew word that means nations. Now, uh, uh, these blessings are something that sometimes we don't understand the role of uh, Jew and Gentile in the body of Messiah. Uh, we, we describe it as the one new man. But the expectation was that all Israel would be saved and then the blessings would go out to the rest of the world. But God has turned that upside down when uh, Peter saw that, and many other Jewish people, that the Gentiles were receiving the gift of the Ruach, the gift of the Spirit, just as the Jewish people had. And this was a revelation from God that this was to be a worldwide redemption to the, to, and, and um, reconciliation to the creator of the universe. It wasn't just for the Jewish people. Now I want to talk for a moment about this week's Haftarah. Uh, it's the fifth in a series of seven Haftarot of Consolation. And you heard words of consolation that we read earlier. Uh, these seven portions uh, from the prophets, uh, primarily Isaiah and Jeremiah, uh, are selected in the seven weeks following the Jewish day of calamity the ninth of Av. And these seven weeks, uh, when we read these Haftarot of Consolation, are also the seven weeks that lead up to the Feast of Trumpets. And so um, we see on the, the screen the various calamities that have uh, occurred uh, tied to the uh, ninth of Av. The Haftar portion for this week is Yeshiahu, Isaiah 54, verses 1 through 10. Uh, the first verse, Isaiah 54, verse 1, describes Israel, uh, as we sang earlier, as being like a barren woman, a sign that she is experiencing the curses of the Torah for her disobedience. According to Deuteronomy 28, verse 4, fruitfulness was a sign of the Lord's blessing. And according to Deuteronomy 28, verse 18, barrenness was one of the curses. Yet the subsequent verses in Isaiah 54 make it clear that the Lord is, stands ready to take Israel back despite her waywardness. Isaiah 54 verses 2 and 3 suggest that she will have so many children that she will, in need, oh, she will need to enlarge the space for her tents. Now what has brought about this reconciliation? Well, we're talking about Isaiah 54, right? Anybody know what chapter of Isaiah comes before Isaiah 54? 53. Isaiah 53, uh, where we see the, the role of the suffering servant addressing the problem of the waywardness, the sinfulness of the people, including the apostasy of the nation of Israel. Isaiah 53, verse 8 says, Because he was cut off out of the land of the living for the crimes of my people, who deserve the punishment themselves. Once again, we see it a second time. Here in Isaiah, we talked. Paul talked about it in Galatians, that Messiah took on the punishment that we deserve. Messiah took on the punishment that the Jewish people deserved. 
uh, as we read about their waywardness, but all we have to do as we point out over and over is keep reading and we see that their waywardness only is a, uh, gives us the opportunity to understand in an even greater way the grace of God as no matter how much they stray, He stands ready to take them back. Isaiah 54 verses 7 and 8. Talk about consolation. The Lord stresses how short the time was that he had forsaken Israel compared to the amount of time that he will bestow his chesed, his everlasting, kind, uh, kindly, his everlasting loving kindness upon her. And this should be a comfort to us, or at least those of us, who stray from the Lord on occasion. You know, I mentioned in the past there are some who think that God has forsaken Israel because they have in fact strayed. This is called replacement theology because these people conclude that the promises that God made to the Jewish people will now go to what they see as their replacement, the church. But if we only keep reading uh, after these verses of chastisement due to Israel's straying, we find similar situations to what we read in Isaiah 54 that God still desires to draw the people, excuse me, to draw his people back to him because this uh, is his opportunity to demonstrate his faithfulness in full measure. He will be faithful because he is the covenant keeping God and he will keep every promise he has ever made to them. And those who buy into this theology ignore Paul's warning against this way of thinking. In Romans 11, verses 20 and 21, Rabbi Shaul, Paul says, Yes, the natural branches, meaning the Jewish people in this olive tree uh, metaphor, uh, were broken off because of unbelief. But then Paul provides the following warning in Romans 11, verse 21. Here's how it reads in the King James. If God did not spare the natural branches, take heed, yes, he, yet lest he also spare not thee. The reality is, like Israel, we, ha we all had at one time forsaken our Creator. But like Israel, He is willing to take us back because of His everlasting loving kindness, because of Messiah's sacrifice on our behalf, because of God's faithfulness to the Jewish people. We all are able to make Teshuvah, to turn back to the Lord, knowing that He will treat us with kindness and bestow His everlasting love upon us. And the Torah portion closes out with the passage we read earlier from the end of Deuteronomy chapter 25. Another example where the Lord uh, deals with His people as a community. Talking about the Amalekites. God says the Israelites are not to forget how they treated the children of Israel during their exodus from Egypt. He reminds them that the Amalekites attacked them from the rear. And that was a sign that they did not fear the Lord, uh, according to the uh, scriptures. As, much, uh, as such, once the Israelites are dwelling safely in the land, they're to blot out all memory of Amalek from under heaven. How do we do that? Well, actually, that carries over uh, into our modern day observance of one of the traditional holidays that's based on uh, the scriptures, the book of Esther, uh, Purim, Purim. Because whenever a descendant of Amalek, uh, which is how we think of Haman, uh, whenever his name is said, he is booed as we seek to drown out the remembrance of Amalek. Tonight we've seen the importance of community. How the nation of Israel is described as both the Lord's firstborn and also as an unfaithful wife. And despite their waywardness and ours, God has always and will always remain faithful to His covenant commitments. Now there may be someone here tonight or watching the, the video uh, who you've never experienced God's covenant faithfulness in your life. But you now realize that the only way anyone can experience that today is by accepting the sacrifice that Messiah Yeshua provided so that we are able to be seen as righteous not because of our own works but because of Yeshua's righteousness being seen in us. So I'd like to ask with every head bowed and every eye closed, 
allowing the Spirit of God to minister to hearts right now. If you now see that you need to trust in the promises of the Creator of the universe by saying yes to His provision of His Son, Messiah Yeshua's sacrifice on your behalf, all you have to do is raise your hand and you can put it right back down. Is there anyone? We always give that opportunity. We never take for granted uh, that everyone has made that decision. And during this season of Teshuvah, uh, we heard the blast of the trumpet tonight. And we said that one of the purposes was to be a call to look within. And Lord, I, I just ask that you would, uh, this night, through this time of introspection, uh, in this season of Teshuvah, uh, that you would reveal to us, Lord, where you would have us uh, to make changes in our lives. To, uh, you know, perhaps you've wandered away from the Lord and you now realize it wasn't the Lord moving away from you. It's been you moving away from Him. Perhaps you've forgotten your first love as this world and the trials and tribulations that we encounter can seem overwhelming at times and cause us to forget about the uh, love of God that we have experienced. And you can turn back to the Lord and move closer to Him so that He might uh, draw you even closer uh, and love you with His everlasting love. And that will sustain you through any trial that you may be facing. Or maybe you did not realize that the Torah was still uh, God's instruction manual for us as believers today. But now you see that we are called to be obedient to His instructions. Or there's also people who uh, have been obedient in an effort to be seen as righteous, what we refer to as legalism. And you now realize that our motivation to keep Torah is supposed to be based on our love for the one who has revealed it to us. Or perhaps you've been going it as a lone wolf and you now realize that um, God deals in many ways with us as part of a community. And if you feel the Lord's leading you to become a part of this community, uh, you can see my wife afterwards for membership information. But if you feel that the Lord would have you to make a change in some area that He has shown you this evening. I would just ask you to raise your hand. Once again, you can put it right back down. But this is a, a raising our hands as a sign of our commitment that we will remember that, Lord, you showed us to make the change in this particular area. And, Lord, we are saying not, your will, uh, not our will, Lord, but your will be done uh, as uh, I seek to be more conformed to the image of Messiah for your purposes and for your glory. Lord, we thank you for this season of Teshuvah as you are calling your Jewish people throughout the world as they uh, come to the synagogue, they are reminded that we are in the season of Teshuvah, that you are calling your people back to you. And Lord, I pray that our Jewish people uh, would, would be able to see that you have provided the only way of salvation in Messiah Yeshua. Lord, that you would just open their eyes uh, and, and reveal this to them in a supernatural way. And Lord, I pray that we would see all people through your eyes, that you would give us opportunities to display unconditional love, to share the truths of your unconditional love that we find uh, in the scriptures for those who perhaps have never experienced it. And Lord, we thank you for all that you're doing in our lives, in the life of our congregation, in the life of every person who is here. And we thank you, Lord, in the name above all names, in the name of your Son, Messiah Yeshua, and all God's people said, Amen and Amen. God bless you all. Thank you all for coming this evening. Thanks to all who had a part in our service. Now we are going to uh, conclude our service with some blessings and a closing song. At this time, I would like to call our cantor back up as we will pronounce the blessings over the fruit of the vine and the bread, known as the Kiddush and the Hamotzi, uh, as we sanctify the service unto the Lord and we thank Him for His provision. <laughs> Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. Amen. Amen.
And we say L'chaim, which means to life, because Tevye sang it in Fiddler on the Roof, and it's good enough for Tevye, it's good enough for me. L'chaim, L'chaim, to life, to life, to life, L'chaim. Baruch Adonai, Elohim Melech HaOlam, Hamotzi Lechem Min Haaretz. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread and all merit food from the earth. Amen. Amen. And now I'm going to ask everyone to please stand as we are going to pronounce uh, a blessing that the Lord instructed Moses to have his brother Aaron, the first Kohen Gadol, the first high priest, pronounce these words a blessing over his people. Stand and receive the blessing of the Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and show you his favor. May the Lord lift up his face toward you and give you peace. And in the name of Messiah Yeshua, may we all go in peace. Amen. Amen. Before we have our closing song, uh, I thanked everybody who had a part in this service. But it's such an encouragement to uh, see Eli um, being able to do the, the canting, to uh, take what he learned as he was preparing for his bar mitzvah and turn it into a blessing for the congregation. Now we're going to uh, sing our closing song. It's the Ein Kelohenu. It means there is no one like our God. We'll sing it first in the Hebrew and then in the English. The Ein Kelohenu. That's good in the Hebrew. Let's see how we do with the English. There is no one like our God. There is no one like our Lord. There is no one like our King. There is no one like our Messiah. Who is like our God? Who is like our Lord? Who is like our King? Who is like our Messiah? We give thanks to our God. We give thanks to our Lord. We give thanks to our King, we give thanks to Messiah. Blessed be our God, blessed be our Lord, blessed be our King, blessed be our Messiah. You are the one our God, you are the one our Lord, you are the one our King, you are the one our Messiah. Amen and amen. God bless you all. Have a great week in Messiah. Enjoy the time of fellowship. Amen. Shabbat Shalom.